Great. All right, let's get started. Um, some of you guys might think that I cleaned up my beard and hair for you. I didn't. I'm sorry. Uh, I was actually growing out a nice Grizzly Adams beard, which I was excited about. But then I was best manning in a wedding yesterday in Oakdale in 106 degrees, which was awesome. So if you didn't like the warm weather, I promise you I had it worse. It was in a tuxedo out in baking sun. But it was a good time. It was fun. Uh, uh, Rachel, my fiance, and I were where she is. Where she? There she is. Okay. Um, we got to be in the wedding. It was, it was a great time. Um, but they forced me to clean up. So, which helps though, because I'm speaking to you today. Um, anyways, um, so if you haven't been with us the last few weeks, or maybe you have, let's kind of recap where we've been, and I'll tell you where we're going, okay? So, um, Jeff, our main speaking pastor, talked for a few weeks about this idea of orthodoxy and orthopraxy, okay? So, orthodoxy is like um, the knowledge of the word, the orthodoxy, like knowing the word of God. Orthopraxy is the practical use of Praxy, practical use of the word. And so Jeff made a good comment, I think, and I agree with it. He said, Americans, we're really good at knowing orthodoxy, like we're really good at knowing the word, but we, but we can talk about it all day, we can do Bible studies and all that stuff, but we have a hard time putting into action the, the practical part. And then um, last week, Pat spoke about um, what is the pract- how do we practically put that into place? And one of the things he brought up was practically confessing. Like, how do we take the idea of confession and not just leave in the Bible, but practice it and confess to one another? He talked about that. Jeff's going to be with us next week, and then we have Church in the Park. So he's going to start this new series more about how do we practically apply our faith. That's where we're going. However, I'm not sure if he's going to start that next week, being that we're going to be at the Church in the Park afterwards. He might start it after Church in the Park. But basically what I'm telling you is I'm looking at the lay of the land between all these messages and I'm like, okay, what can I contribute today to you? And what I think I can contribute today is this, is um, if you guys know me, I'm I'm really, I love um, being out there in the street. I love mentoring high school kids. So the whole idea of like practically going do ministry, I could sit here for hours and be like, oh, you know, this one time I mentored this one kid and this and that and Jesus, yay. But... I feel like I've I've shared that with you guys a couple times. And and what I'd rather do is teach you a little bit more about some of the personalities in God that I see that help my reasoning of my why that then turn into my how. Does that make sense? I'd rather teach you who I I see God God is, his character, and then how that affects me is the practical part. And so, so basically today I thought, you know what? With talking about forgiveness last week, talking about this idea of orthodoxy versus orthopraxy, um, I I just kind of want to talk a little bit further about who the character of God is to me, his characteristics, and how that affects us. And so uh, today we're going to talk about the lion and the lamb, strength under control. And the characteristic of God I really want to talk about today is is his demeanor as both as lion and lamb. So I'm sure all of us have maybe heard before like God being referred to as a lion and then also Jesus as the Lamb of God. And I'm going to talk about today how those two mix together. And hopefully from that, his personality, it'll then go into how we apply our lives. Does that make sense? Say yeah. yeah. All right, cool. All right, so let's go for it. So the idea of the lion and the lamb, there's several parts in scripture to me that really show uh, God being the lion and the lamb, kind of like all within sentences to each other. And... Um, Forgive me, every pastor has their certain scripture that become like deer trails where they just go over them again and again and again. And, and one of them for me is Revelations 5. I'm not going to actually go through the scripture, but I'm going to kind of summarize it. But Revelation 5 to me is huge. I love this chapter. And uh, so let's hop into it a little bit. So basically, Revelation 5, there's a moment where we see the lion and the lamb. And in Revelation, it's kind of like the beginning of the end. It's the end of the world. It's Jesus coming back, full power of God, right? All that good stuff. And um, in that, um, uh, John is having these visions and he's writing down what he's seeing for the end of the world and his visions. And, and he writes down in John chapter 5, he says that he's basically at the throne and he sees all of creation around him and they have this scroll, right? And the scroll, if it's open, is going to basically just bring forth the kingdom of God. It's going to like be the whole, whole, like heaven and earth will be destroyed and the whole new earth is going to come. And, and they're right at the cusp of that. And John says that he sees this mighty angel stand up. And the mighty angel is like, basically says, hey, who is worthy to open up the scroll? 
who is worthy to bring forth the kingdom of God? Like, you know, this big angel saying that. And now some theologians theorize that this big angel was perhaps Satan. Maybe it was Satan kind of testing everyone like, hey, which one of you is worthy to bring forth the kingdom of God? You know, and of course, no one's going to, mm, uh, you know, I've had some blemishes in my life. I've had some sinful moments. And so John, when he sees this happening, he sees no one moving. John starts to cry. He's like upset that no one can bring forth the kingdom of God. And, but this elder says next to him, he says, hey, don't worry. The lion of the tribe of Judah is going to come forward. And right at that moment, the next sentence is like, and then I saw a lamb come forward, right? So we're talking about this lion come forward, but then this lamb comes forward, right? Now, if you guys ever had, now remember, this is like a dream that John is having. He's writing down all this stuff. Have you guys ever had a dream that like in your dream, you knew this was someone, but they didn't look like that person. They looked like someone else. You guys are, yeah, you've had that before? Thank you. Awesome. Because <laughs> other church services look at me like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm like, you're a liar. It happens. So like, I'll call my mom and be like, mom, you were in my dream last night. And I knew it was you, but you looked like Bob Barker. It was just like... <laughs> And it was like, the price is right, and we're trying to do something, but you were crazy, you know. And so, and I think this is kind of that moment, does that make sense? Where, where John is, like, like, this elder's like, hey, the lion's coming forward. And so it's like, cool. And all you Narnia people right now are going nuts, like, oh, yeah, yeah, right. But, but the lion is coming forward, right? But then all of a sudden pops up this little lamb, right? But for John, though, and for everyone else, they knew that this is the lion, Right? And, and, and what it, the point is, is this, is that God is, I think, referred to first as the lion, like this powerful um, leader of the universe who is justice and righteousness and, and the lead, like he's the pride, he's the leadership. But yet Jesus comes forward as the lamb, as the sacrifice, right? Who, who takes away the sins of the world. He is the lamb, he's the living sacrifice. He died for our sins, and so it's really cool that we get to celebrate both the lion and the lamb in the same person, the same being, which is God. And I love that. I love that we have a God that is fully righteous and loving and wants justice, but at the same time, he provides us grace and forgiveness. Cool. But uh, I want to start off with that. Um, as we kick off the lion and the lamb. Uh, in the Old Testament, I believe that we start to see the characteristic of God of the lion and the lamb. And my favorite one is 2 Kings chapter 6. So if you want to turn to that one, this is a fun one to go through. 2 Kings chapter 6. To set it up, there is this guy, Elijah, who is like a man of God. He's seeing visions from God. He's a prophet. God is in favor of him. And um, Aram, this neighboring country, is at war with Israel, which is like God's country, right? is at war with Israel, and the king of Aram is trying to take over Israel. Check it out what it says. It says, um, when the king of Aram was at war with Israel, he would confer with his officials and say, we will mobilize our forces in such and such a place, okay? So the king of Aram is at the war table with his officials. He's like, hey, we're going to flank Israel from here and here, right? But check this out. Um, but immediately Elijah, the man of God, would warn the king of Israel, do not go near that place, for the Ramians are planning to mobilize their troops there. So the king of Israel would send word to the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elijah warned the king so that he would be on alert there, right? So every single time that the king of Aram is trying to flank him or do this move, Elijah would get a vision from God or whatever and would warn the king of Aram, hey, don't go there. And it's this cat and mouse chase. And the king of Aram is getting really frustrated. Look at what he says. He says, the king of Aram became very upset over this. He called his officials together and demanded, which one of you is the traitor? <laughs> Who is informing the king of Israel my plans? Now, you imagine, you know, if you're an official and your king is calling you a traitor, you're pretty much visioning your head on a post at this point, right? And so they're like, uh, no, it's not us, my lord, the king. The one of the officials replied, Elijah, the prophet in Israel, tells the king of Israel even the words you speak in the privacy of your bedroom. Go and find out where he is, the king commanded, so I can send troops and seize him. So these officials are like, dude, like, this guy Elijah is like, he knows the words you're mumbling in your sleep. You know what I'm saying? He's like, if you really want to take out Israel, you got to take out Elijah because he's like their number one intelligence force. And so King Ram's like, all right. So he sends this big army out after Elijah. So here's Elijah. And the report came back. Elijah's at Dothan, this little town. So one night, the king of Aram sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city for one guy. When the servant of the man of God got up early next morning and went outside, there were troops, horses, chariots everywhere. 
oh, sir, what do we do now? The young man cried to Elijah. So like this little water boy comes out in the morning and just sees all these troops and soldiers. And he's just like, I just picture him be like, all right, I'm going to go back inside now, right? And so Elijah, there's all these guys everywhere. What do we do, right? And so I kind of picture myself with this water boy, like just freaking out, right? And Elijah, though, look at what Elijah says. He says, don't be afraid, Elijah told him, for there are more on our side than there are on theirs, which is like just the two of them standing there. And Elijah prayed, oh, Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw that on the hillside around Elijah was filled with horses and chariots of fire. Awesome. <laughs> like rock and roll in the Bible right there. <laughs> you know, this guy, like basically the water boy, as I refer to him, just gets his eyes open and just sees on the hillside this whole army of angels and chariots of fire, right? And what's so cool about that is, um, one, that you get to see that, but two, um, they say that one angel is equivalent to 30,000 men, right? So if a king of Rams got 30,000 men, God could have honestly just sent down like one little fat angel, like, <laughs> just like, you know, just taking them all out, right? But instead, he sends down this whole force, just this army of angels, right? And, 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 you know, we always think of fire in the Bible. It's like, oh, fire is hell. But, but here it's like we see the God of fire, right? The righteous fire of God. And he comes down and he's ready to defend Elijah. Let me pause right there. So the, kind of the whole idea of the unseen, right? And um, I got a couple different stories like this, but I don't think I'll share this one with you yet. There was um, in the youth network, uh, we have the youth network in the area. It's like all the youth pastors get together and we, you know, fellowship and ups and downs and how we doing and we strategize for the city together. And uh, it was like maybe two years ago, we we're hanging out and um, we we're asking how our summers were, ups and downs. And this guy, Dave Shalero, who's on staff with Harbor Light, uh, youth pastor there, was sharing and he said, I got this one girl in my youth group and she had the craziest story. Everyone leans in, right? All right, let's hear it. So this girl had been to Harbor Lights Youth Group for like maybe two or three weeks, and she had never been to church before, like just like first time, just going to church, you know, and she'd been, you know, just going there for two or three weeks. Church was new to her. Unrelated to that, you know, she goes out uh, to City Beach with some of her friends, which City Beach is right around the corner. There's rock climbing there. And this girl is rock climbing with her friends, belayed on, all that stuff, gets up to the top, belay breaks, falls 20, 30 feet. This girl should be dead, right? Gets rushed off to the hospital, months of recovery, recovers, comes back to youth group. And after youth group says to Dave, like, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? And he was like, yeah, you know, sure. So they talk on the side. And she said, Dave, are there angels? Like, do you, in the Bible, are there angels? And he's like, yeah. And he's like, do they have names? And he's like, yeah, some do. Is there one named Gabriel? And, she, and Dave's like, yeah, kind of a big deal. <laughs> Gabriel was the one, he's one of the top angels, came to Mary and said, hey, you know, you're going to give birth to the savior of the world, right? Um, and she goes, yeah, as soon as I hit the ground, this guy grabbed my hand and said, hey, my name is Gabriel, and I'm going to carry you through this thing. Like, you're going to live, you're going to be okay. And, and held her hand throughout the whole ambulance ride all the way to the hospital. And then when she woke up, she's like, hey, where's this guy Gabriel? And they're like, uh, we don't have any staff or medic. You know, she looked into it. There's no paramedics named Gabriel, nothing like that. And so <laughs> it's just, it's, it's surprising to me. And, and I would like to believe it. Um, but it's just shocking to me, you know, like, what do we not see? You know, this young guy did not see this whole army, right? And, and, and what's so funny to me is this girl had no idea how God was looking over her, right? And, and, and this is the funniest part to me. The same Gabriel who, who told Mary, you're going to bring the Savior into the world, is then later on at City Beach in Fremont, California. <laughs> you know? Can you imagine if that was in Scripture? First, Gabriel went and told Mary about Jesus. Then he went to City Beach. <laughs> you know? Like, really? You know? But it's kind of funny that we laugh at it, isn't it? Because it's so like out of our context, like there's no way that could actually happen. But I'm telling you guys, the same God that was working 2,000 years ago is the same God that's working today. God is beyond time. He doesn't, he, God was never born. He'll never die. He's always been. And for us that live in a three-dimensional world, we cannot understand a God that's beyond time and dimension, right? But here is the lion of God who, who this little water boy is just like freaking out because he doesn't see an out to this. But yet the God of the universe is like, no, if you open up your eyes, you'd see this whole angel chariots of fire they have surrounding you, right? Super rad. Check this out. Look at what happens. 
the lion is ready to strike. As the Ramian army advanced towards him down this hill, Elijah prayed, O Lord, please make them blind. And so the Lord struck them with blindness as Elijah had asked. And then Elijah went out and told them, you've come the wrong way. This isn't the right city. Follow me and I will take you to the man you are looking for. And he led them to the city of Samaria. So I love this. I don't know what type of blindness he struck him with, but I kind of picture like Star Wars, you know, like you are in the wrong city, you know, (laughs) we are in the wrong city, right? And then he leads them to Samaria, which Samaria is like the ally neighbor to Israel, right? And so gets them into Samaria and you got this whole army He's looking for this one dude and he's, he's leading them on a tour to Samaria. And look what they do though. Here comes the lamb. As soon as they entered Samaria, Elijah prayed, oh Lord, now open their eyes and let them see. So the Lord opened their eyes and they discovered that they were in the middle of Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he shouted to Elijah, my father, should I kill them? Should I kill him? Of course not, Elijah said. Do, do we kill prisoners of war? Give them food and drink and send them home again to their master. So the king made a great feast for them and sent them home to their master. After that, the Ramian raiders stayed away from the land of Israel. I love it. Can you imagine like these guys walking home back to a ram with like leftovers and a toothpick like after the barbecue? Like, that Elijah guy was cool, <laughs> you know? <laughs> the king of rams just like, oh, I can't stand you guys, you know? But I love it. Do you see it? The lion and the lamb, right? There's this God who's this, this justice ferocious lion with his chariots of fire, but yet he strikes them with blindness, opens their eyes back in, and, and, and feeds them and sends them home. And, and this is the God we serve. He's a hu- I think he's a humorous God. But he's a God that, that has the strength of both. And he could have wiped out those guys, but instead he pushed the love of God into another country through what could have been a bloody massacre, right? Let's look at some other examples. Um, John chapter two, I've spoken on this one before. Again, favorite deer path for me. Um, Jesus is clear in the temple, okay? So check this out. It says, it was early time for the Jewish Passover celebration, so Jesus went to Jerusalem. Okay, so Jesus is, it's around Passover time. Jesus is going into Jerusalem, and as we know, if you read this before, he's about to go in the temple, and he's going to find things bad, and he's going to take care of it. He's going to get a little angry, okay? But before we talk about that, let's talk about Passover for a second because I'm, I think it makes it that much more meaningful. Um, Passover, um, basically, um, uh, if you're familiar with it, in Egypt, you know, a thousand years back, Moses, all the Jewish people are in slavery in Egypt, right? It's like four million Jewish people in slavery in Egypt. And, and, and God is orchestrating Moses, telling him to talk to Pharaoh and say like, hey, um, talk to Pharaoh and tell him he's got to let our people go. And if he doesn't, then I'm going to send plagues until Pharaoh understands that I'm God, he's not, and my people need to go. Because Pharaohs back then, they thought they were God, right? So Moses is coming to him saying, hey, my God is telling me that you need to let the, the, the Jewish people go. And Pharaoh's stubborn and is not listening. And so after all these plagues, the final plague is, uh, is God says to Pharaoh through Moses, if you don't let my people go, tonight all the firstborn sons will be killed, including animals. So just every firstborn in Egypt is going to die tonight, unless you let the Israelis go. And of course, Pharaoh doesn't listen. So Moses uh, also gets a message, though, to the believing uh, Israelis to say to them, hey, um, God said that if you are God-fearing and you don't want to be harmed by this plague, kill a lamb, take it, take the blood and paint it over the doorway of your house tonight and stay in your house. And that night when the, the spirit of God came through, it, it, it took away all the firstborn sons except for houses that had the blood of the lamb painted over the doorway, right? Which is pretty fierce. It's the lion. There's the lamb, there's the grace, right? But this is what's so cool to me is, is Jesus is referred to as the lamb of God, right? Jesus is the lamb of God. And when we believe in Christ, we believe that Jesus was the Lamb of God, that Jesus was sacrificed and killed for our sins, that everything I ever did wrong, Jesus died for as a lamb would be a sacrifice. Jesus died for When I take that blood and I claim that on my heart, I say, the blood of Christ cleans me. The blood of Christ, the blood of Christ is basically painted over my heart and the wrath of God sees that and passes over me, Right? That when we believe that Jesus, uh, what he did was by saving lamb, the wrath of God will pass over me. And so I really struggled for a long time with like, gosh, God would just wipe out all these kids, you know, all these firstborns in, in Egypt. But at the same time, he turns around and he gives up his son for humanity, right? 
And so keeping that in mind, look at the rest of the, the account. It says, verse 14, in the temple area, Jesus saw merchants selling cattle, sheep and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. Jesus made a whip from some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. He drove out the sheep and the cattle, scattered the money changers' coins over the floor, and turned over their tables. So basically, Jesus is walking into Jerusalem during the time of Passover. He knows that he's going to die on the cross for believers. He knows he's going to die. He knows that that's his destiny. And, and, and he is the, the Lamb of God. He's walking into the temple. And what he finds instead of a celebration, the fact that he's there, is he finds all these priests that are corrupt and are, are, are basically being a middleman. As people walk in for their sacrifice to God, the priests are saying, oh, that, that, that sheep isn't good enough. Let me take that off your hands, but you could buy this one for $100, right? And, and, they're, and they're just doing this. They're just taking that last sheep and then selling it to the next guy. And they're making money. They're profiting off, or off of people trying to worship God. So, of course, Jesus walks in just ticked. And starts just flipping tables. He makes a rope, uh, makes a whip out of some ropes. Then going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Uh, But the Jewish leaders demanded him, what are you doing? If God gave you authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign and prove it. And Jesus is like, all right, Jesus replied, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. And they say, what? They exclaimed. It's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you can rebuild it in three days. But, Jesus, but when Jesus said this temple, he meant his own body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this, and they believed both the scriptures and what Jesus had said. Okay, a couple notes. To me, in my opinion, I, I, I kind of wonder like, if Jesus was more so like flipping tables also because he knew that he was going to die on the cross. Does that make sense? Was he in there and just seeing like, how much of a mess this thing had become and just being like, Oh, just like flipping tables, like the only way for me to clean this up is for me to be the lamb in this situation, right? And then in that moment, he's like just getting angry, righteous anger, probably thinking about dying on the cross. And look at what the priests say to him. They're just like super snotty. They're like, what are you doing, right? (laughs) If God gave you authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign and prove it. What are you doing, right? And... You can tell that they know that they're wrong because they're not necessarily a grabbing him, but they're just like, you know, like they know they're wrong, right? But like, who are you, right? Because he's killing their prophets. And I love though what Jesus, look, look what he says in the green. He's like, all right, all right. Jesus replied, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And I love it. He's talking about his body. And, and here's the point. In the snotty moment that these guys are just defying God and are being brats and don't even realize it, he's already saying, I'm going to die for you. Like, you don't get it. You're a brat. But I'm going to die for you. Like, how, how often are we there? We're just snotty and we just don't understand what God's doing. He's like, all right, you don't get it, Brett, but I'm going to die for you. And, and it, what it leads me to is this for us is where do we need the lamb in our life? Where do we need grace? Where do we need to give ourselves grace? Where do we need uh, forgiveness? Where do we need a savior, right? At the same point, where do we need the line in our life? You know, there's this little thin book we used in high school. uh, It's called My Heart Cries Home. If you've never read it, just get it. It's like two bucks. It's like this big. It'll take you 10 minutes to read. But it totally changed my life because it refers to our heart as a home for God. And it it challenged me and it said, okay, Imagine your life is like a house. You have your family room where you welcome people. You have your kitchen, and then you have your bathroom and your closet. And it challenged me to say, do you allow God into your closet in our life? Do we, would we allow the lion to come into our closet and get frustrated with it and allow God to start flipping tables in our closet? Do we allow the lion? And sometimes we need the lion, right? Sometimes we need, sometimes we need someone to come into our house and just break the system and just kind of flip things upside down so we can restart. And I think the reason why God wants to do that with us is because you say, hey, I got better uses of this room in your life. There is something better waiting for you. Let's get this junk out of here, right? Clear it out. And I think that goes a lot with what, with, uh, what um, Pat was speaking about last week is confession. It's like, how do we confess to each other? Like, hey, this is what I'm really struggling with and I need God to flip my life upside down. And, and, and the strength in that, guys, is honestly finding someone, confessing to them, and, in, and then allowing God to just rip and root that stuff out and make way for the good things he wants for you. 
And the last thing I take from the scripture is this, is do we give grace even when people don't get it? Have you guys ever, like, <laughs> given grace and someone just didn't get it? You know what I mean? You're just like, oh, I freaking love you. Um, and in this moment, you know, Jesus is like, you know, these guys are being really snotty, like, who are you, right? And right in the moment, Jesus is like, I'm going to die for you. I love you. You don't get it, but I love you. And he gives grace. And I guess the best example I could give of that um, little story here is I have a, a young guy with special needs I mentor. He's, he's kind of turned into a man now. We've been hanging out for a long time. But he's, he's right at that like, special needs where it's, you know, you, you wouldn't really know it unless you've been hanging out with him for like 15, 20 minutes. And um, he loves buffets. He, he just loves them. Because when you go to a buffet, you could pay $7 and break the margins. Like, I'm going to eat $32 worth of food, and I'm going to get my keep, right? And so we go out to these buffets. We go on to a lot of them. And I bring a magazine now because I know we're going to be there for like three hours, right? <laughs> and, and he'll sit there, and he'll get to his last plate. His last plate is always jello and grapes, which is really funny. I don't know why. And, but he gets the last plate, and he's eating the grapes, and he's literally going, uh, uh, like, like trying to just get it in, <laughs> you know? And there's been a couple moments where, you know, we're driving home and he's like, game time. He rolls down the windows, throwing up. And I'm like, all right. And I'm like, did you learn your lesson? He's like, yep. You know, but next time we go, he's eating another seven plates of food, right? And so, so anyways, uh, there's this one time we're going to this buffet and we set up the lunch date to be like four o'clock. You know, we're going to get there by four because lunch hour ends at four. If we get there by four, we're going to get the $7 cost, right? And so I, I had a meeting, got out late, and he's blowing up my phone, like, where are you, where are you, where are you? And so I finally picked him up, and we get over there, and we get there at like 4.01, you know. And I talked to the guy at front, I was like, hey, I'm terribly sorry, and my guy's over here just like freaking out, like, uh, you know. And I was like, I'm terribly sorry, we really wanted to get here for the lunch rate, um, we're a little late, Is, can you honor it? And he's like, and no, no, just like straightforward, just like right here, he's like, yeah, no worries, absolutely, you eat lunch and, you know, take care of you guys. And I said, great, what time does your dinner rate start at? He's like, five. I was like, we'll even be out by 4.59 because we don't want to dip into your dinner rate. And he's like, okay. So we go in there and so this kid's just, just going to town, right? And so at like 4.58, 4.59, we come up and we're like, all right, ready to pay the bill. And I had like one other guy with me too. And the guy's like, here you go, puts down the bill and it's like $23 a person. He like charged us the dinner rate, you know? And, and my kid is going nuts. He's like, oh, we're so sorry. Like, we left at 4.58. We didn't want to tip in the, the dinner. He's like, no, I told you from the start. I let you in the dinner early, and now you're trying to con me, and you want to pay lunch rates, and, and you owe me dinner rates. And I'm just like, ooh. Like, <laughs> this guy's being a snake. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm sorry. There's no other way to say it. I'm like, this guy's being a snake. And so I'm just like, okay. And this kid's freaking out because, you know, he's, it's going to cost him $23 instead of 7 And I'm like, all right. So I was like, all right, it's, it's fine. And I just, I lay down like 70 bucks for the whole meal. And I'm just like, whatever. You know, you got that weak feeling. You're like, whatever. So we leave and the kid is relieving. He's like, hey, thanks for doing that. And I was like, cool. And he's like, you know, you probably had to pay all that much money because it taught you a lesson because you were late picking me up. And I was like... <laughs> You know, I love you, man. I love you. You know, I was just like, oh, and a little bit that's true, but it hurt this much. You know, it's just like, man, like he did the whole grace part. I paid for your meal. No, nothing. You know, oh. but what that did for me is this is, is I got to this point with this kid. I was like, will this kid ever get it? Will he ever get it? You know what I'm saying? But then he got me thinking about myself with God and God's like, Brett, will you ever get it? I wonder if we're going to go to heaven and God's going to be like, hey, did you know that you were like this for 60 years and you never figured that out about your personality? Like you drove people nuts, Brett, but you never realized it for 60 years. And I'm just like, oh, oh, you know, I feel like we're all going to have those moments. And some people refer to it as your bad breath self, right? Because everyone knows you have bad breath except for you, Right. You know what I'm saying? Like people are like, oh. And, and why is it that people with bad breath, they always want to use H words around you? Like, hey. You know? <laughs> like, how's Harriet doing? <laughs> Ugh, you know? <laughs> All right, dude. Chill. You know what I'm saying? But it's the bad breath self. It's like these things, like we don't know we're doing them, but other people do. And do we give grace even when people don't get it? Do we give grace to people's quirks and mannerisms and we, even when they don't get it? Because we want that back too, amen? All right, let's keep going. 
All right, so uh, Genesis 37 through 45, I promise you I'm not going to read eight chapters of scripture to you. But I, I was trying to think about who's the guy that I see consistent in his demeanor and his temperature. How, who's the guy that really like, you know, stays level in these situations? We talked about this with the youth group. So if you're at youth, here we go again. Um, this guy, Joseph, in the Old Testament. So there's basically the dad's name is Israel. Check this out. It says, now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his brothers or his other sons. Uh, because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made an ornate robe for Joseph. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, uh, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Okay, So Joseph, um, just extra loved by his dad, uh, his dad gives him his really cool coat, and the rest of the brothers can't stand him. Now, I think this is where Joseph, he's like 17 or 18 in this, in this, the, this moment of scripture, this, I, I think, might be a bad breath moment for Joseph, okay? Like, I don't know if he necessarily did anything wrong here, but it's like, dude, you really have to go there? Listen to this. It says, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, hey, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine, and they bowed down to it, right? <laughs> so his brothers are like dropping forks, like, really? You know? And they say, his brother said to him, did you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. You think that Joseph would get the memo, but check it out. Then he had another dream and he told to his brothers, hey, listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. And, so, and in this case, what it is, it's like the sun is the dad, moon is mom and 11 stars are the 11 brothers. And this is a dream from God, right? I get it, but maybe just not the best delivery time, okay? But check this out. It says, when he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. So I like the dad, because he's like, oh, bad delivery, but I know you got a gift from God. You know what I'm saying? And so what I like in this situation is like, I don't know if you guys have been in this situation before, but we all probably know a lot of 17 or 18 year olds in the front row right here. Okay, so <laughs> what do you do with the 17 or 18 year old when you feel like they just know everything, right? What, what do we do? We send them off to college, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, oh, you know everything now, great. All right, get in the car. <laughs> Come back when you're 22 and you figure you know nothing, you know? <laughs> uh, but not in this situation. Uh, they sold Joseph into slavery, so... <laughs> His brothers are like, we can't stand you. Uh, we're just going to sell you into slavery. And so basically what happens, and to sum up the story, is uh, Joseph is out tending sheep with his buddies, with his, with his brothers. And the brothers are so tired of him that they just throw him in this deep pit. And then they're like, do we kill him? What do we do? I don't know. And so basically what they do is they see his caravan going by that's going to Egypt. And they sell him into slavery for like 20 coins. And they take his awesome coat and they tear it up and put blood on it, bring it back to dad like, oh, he died. And the lion got him, right? And so Joseph, long story short, goes to, goes to um, Egypt, who's like dad's favorite, now gone, sold out by his brothers, gets sold into slavery. Luckily, he gets sold to this like high official who sees a lot of potential in Joseph, knows he can read and write, and Joseph earns his way to be second to the top in this guy's household and basically runs the guy's household for a number of years, right? So after a few years of doing this, being obedient, not trying to run away, all stuff, the, the official goes on a business trip and the official's wife tries to pick up on Joseph while the official's out of town. And so she's coming on to Joseph like, hey, let's have an affair and all this stuff. And Joseph is like, no, it doesn't honor God and it doesn't honor your husband, right? Now, pause right there. I wonder how many of us in this moment where we got sold out by our brothers, sold into slavery, claimed dead, are in a different world, different country, have nothing going for us, we're a slave. How many of us would jump at that opportunity? You know what I mean? Here's this high official woman that wants to have an affair with you. You could start your own little palace, right? But he doesn't go for it. He says, it doesn't honor God. It doesn't honor your husband. So she tries to grab him. So he runs and he splits and his robe comes off and she has his robe in hand now. And so then she goes and yells at her to her, like when her husband comes home, like he tried to take advantage of me and has the, the, the robe. So the husband is like, I should basically kill you, but I'm not, throws him in jail where now he is probably in Egyptian terms, probably a slave in building pyramids to gods he doesn't believe in, right? So just the lowest, the lowest, the low. And so do you see his life going like this, right? So a few years go by, Pharaoh in, the, you know, in another part of the country has a dream, and in his dream, he sees seven healthy cows getting eaten by seven ugly cows. 
And he has this dream. He's like, what does this mean? Tells his guys about it. Some of his like cup bearers and stuff. And they say, we don't know, but remember that time you sent us to jail because you didn't like us? <laughs> you had your off day, Pharaoh? Well, when we were there, we met this guy, Joseph, and he interpreted our dreams. And they all came true. And so Pharaoh's like, bring him up. So, so um, Joseph gets called out of jail, goes and interprets the dream for Pharaoh. And he basically says, okay, you got the seven healthy cows. That's hence, you're, Egypt's going to have seven years of like harvest, like good harvest. And the seven ugly cows that eat them is after it's just going to be seven years of plague. And so basically you got to use these seven good years to get ready for these seven bad years. Otherwise everyone's going to die. And Pharaoh's like, okay. And he says, all right, well, wh- how do I get ready? And Joseph says, well, you got to find a good, upright, honest guy and he's got to get ready for you. And Pharaoh's like, okay, you're my guy. And so overnight, Joseph becomes the second in command to Egypt, only below Pharaoh. And this is what it says. says, So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring uh, from his finger, put it from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. Bling blau, right? And then it says, he had him ride in a chariot as a second in command and people shouted before him, make way. Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. So, so just like that, like Joseph is just put in charge of all of Egypt. Now, here's why I do want to make a disclaimer. Uh, what I love about, about Joseph is that he was consistent in his walk with God, right? Whether he was getting dissed by his brothers, dropped off in slavery, or this woman's approaching him, or thrown in jail, or second in command. Even when Pharaoh asked him, can you interpret my dreams? Uh, Joseph said, I can't, but my God can, Right? In his lowest of low and his highest of highs, he never gave credit to himself. He always gave credit to God. And because of that, he made it way through storms and through beautiful sunsets. All right? And then check this out. It even gets better. When he gets confronted with his brothers, his brothers don't even realize who he is. They come to Egypt to get food during the plague, like years later, like nine years later. They come to get food, and he recognizes them. And look what he says to them. He gets a chance to talk to them. He says, then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I'm your brother Joseph, one of you, uh, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed. Do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. I love it. Like you can tell Joseph's been thinking about this for a long time because the first time he meets his brother, he's like, hey, come here. And he says, hey, don't be upset at yourself that you sold me into slavery and called me dead to dad. You know, he's he's already like, but he probably said a lot less passive aggressive than I just did. But but he's like... (laughs) But he's like, hey, don't be upset about that. It, is, it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Like, like Joseph sees it. He's like, dude, God brought me here to, to prepare the way to save Egypt and the whole world known around it. And look, even it gets better. For two years now, there has been famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth to save your lives by the great deliverance. Isn't that great? These 11 brothers are getting saved by the guy they threw in a pit. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me a father to Pharaoh, father to the guy who calls himself God. He made a father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all of Egypt. And so this is, this is my point, guys, is that Moses, or not Moses, Joseph, has this temperature control to his personality, doesn't he? I mean, think about, I talk about this with you. Think about the difference between a mammal and a reptile. A reptile, their temperature is based on their what? Their surroundings, right? So if it's a cold room, the reptile needs to go out to the sun and sit in the sun to change their temperature. Or if it's too hot, they find the shade. How many of us are reptiles? How many of us, we don't have a nice balance of the lion and the lamb yet. We get in a room and the room is cold against us and we get lying real quick. Or we just don't even deal with it. We go into a room that's warm and fuzzy for us and we don't deal with those people, right? Or how many of us, when situations get too hot, and you're like, I'm out, I'm gonna go hang out with this community because they just, they satisfy me. And my, my challenge to you is this, is Joseph did not really get a choice of his community. He was thrown out by his brothers into slavery, gets into a house, where he builds his way back up, has a chance to be with a pretty nice girl, but doesn't take because it doesn't honor God, and because of doing the right thing, he's thrown in jail. And like I was saying before, here's the disclaimer, like some of us will do the right thing. There's Christians around the world that do the right thing every day and get killed for it. And, and they never get paraded around you know, Egypt afterwards, like, yeah, you did the right thing. 
But I think that God's going to honor them in tremendous ways. And so who are we? Are we a mammal? Do we keep a good internal body temperature that when stuff gets hard, when the junk hits a fan, do we allow people to just change our body temperature? Or do we stay in this constant temperature with who Christ is in our life? My temperature should not be based on my surroundings. My temperature should be based on my Savior. My temperature should be based on the fact that, okay, you're being a brat to me right now, just as the Pharisees were being a brat to Jesus, but he says, you know what, grace, here's the grace. This internal temperature, guys, but it only comes with knowing our Savior. Joseph had such a tight relationship with God that when he saw truth, he ran after it. But then also when he saw dilemma or you know, disarray from this girl or from getting thrown in jail, it didn't sway him. He never cursed God in jail. He was faithful the whole way through for like nine years. I want to be that. I want to be faithful like that. But it, it takes us being in the word with God. It takes us being consistent with God to always have him as our lifeline, that God can be our temperature. Amen? Um, I just, I love Joseph in that. And, and here's what I want to say. It's like Joseph experienced the lowest of the lows, right? Sold into slavery. And then he experienced the highest of the highs where he's like second in command um, to Pharaoh. And this is what I want to say. is like, here's that temperature control right here. I think it's a lot easier to fall into sin up here, right? When we've sinned and we're at the bottom of the barrel, we kind of know it. Like, oh God, I, I wrecked my life. I'm sorry. But we're up here and things are good. And my credit card statement looked well and my family's going great. It's just, it's so easy to just be like, I don't need God anymore. I got a credit card. I got popularity. I got good grades. I got all this stuff. This is our weakest moment. And so may we, as same as Joseph, be people that even when we reach second command to our kingdom, that we still go to him. That when Pharaoh says, hey, uh, can you interpret dreams? I can't, but my God can. That's where we need to be, right there. And I want to share this. Um, John 8, um, uh, basically, uh, to summarize this up, is, is Jesus is confronted with a lady caught in adultery. It says this, At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him. And he sat down to teach him. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? They were used this as a question trap, uh, as a trap, in order to have a basis against Jesus. And I love Jesus' temperature control here. Because he's like, if, I, if I'm a lion and I say you should stone her, then I'm going against grace and forgiveness. But if I'm a lamb and I say don't do anything to her, then I'm, then I'm denying the scriptures, right? And isn't it interesting that the woman's caught in adultery, but yet they didn't bring the man in, right? So it's just it's like there's something sketchy here, right? Check this out. Look at how Jesus replies. He says, but Jesus bent down and started writing on the ground with his finger. When he kept questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, all right, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down on the ground and wrote on the ground. This is my favorite part. Look at this. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first. <laughs> so Jesus is like, all right, she messed up. If you haven't messed up, be the first to throw a stone. The older guy's like, ah, oh, dang it. You know, <laughs> I'm out. 30 years ago, right? And it says, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go and leave your life of sin. And this is why I love, let's focus on this. I love this. Now go and leave your life of sin. Jesus, when they all came in, you know, like they're all throwing theology at him and he gives a little roar like a lion. Hey, if you're just, why don't you throw a rock? And they all leave. And then when they all leave, he's now the lamb. He says, neither do I condemn you right? But what I love at the end is he gives a little growl, right? And he says, go and leave this life of sin. And I think it was like a good growl. It's like a coach saying, hey, you're better than this, right? God has so much room he wants to do in our life. He wants to do amazing things, but we got to let him flip some tables and clear out some stuff and make way for the good things he wants in our life. And I'll end with this. Matthew 5, blessed are the meek for they want to inherit the earth. Strength under control. I heard the word meek means strength under control, which I always thought meek is like, eh, meek, right? But it's not. It's strength under control. It's like a soothing medicine or like a horse that's reined up pulling a plow. And if you've ever had poison oak all over your body, which I get it all the time, there's nothing better than a soothing medicine like, oh, strength under control. Thank you, Lord, right? 
And so in this way, may we be strength under control. And look, and why? For we will inherit the earth. Who do you want inheriting the earth? Who do you want in charge of things? You want someone who has their strength under control. They don't abuse it, but they use it. Strength under control. So may we as people, you know, figure out this thing. How do we be the line of the lamb? Where do we need grace? Where do we need to give grace? Where do we need to let God flip some tables in our life? And how do we be like Joseph? We're in the lowest lows or lowest, uh, the highest of highs that we have the strength under control. So I just want to bring that to you guys, just a little bit, talk about who the characteristics of God is to me. And may that form us and shape us, our characters, and how we love others. Let me pray.